just like to give a big shout out to the administrators here at Safa as well as Tulani for actually coming through with this uh, where we can all learn something new and it progresses forward. Uh, I've been commissioned with chairing this next session where we've got lots of esteemed speakers here with us and uh, it's a privilege to be on the stage with them. The first speaker that we're going to have up is Dr. Odi Singh. Uh, he has so many qualifications, it's taken out about three lines on this uh, little bio that uh, Tulani gave me. Um, Dr. Adi Seng is from Botswana and is involved in many, many industries as a sports physician. He's a medical director of some of the clinics in Botswana. Uh, even up to recently, he's been on the medical commission for the Gold Coast Games as well. He's been on the IOC Medical Education Committee as well. And uh, he's presently the chair of the Botswana Football Association Medical Committee as well. So with that in mind, I'd like to please call upon Dr. Odiseng in order to ask uh, and inform us on a lot of questions that were asked in the previous session about FIFA medical rules and regulations, something important that affects us as medical practitioners, medical personnel on the field and off the field. Dr. Odiseng. <coughs> Bagetsu Dumelang from Botswana, which is a country about this country. Not super country, but a bit above that. Um like you say like it like a Dumelisas Abaholo Iwe Zimo Forum in English I could say all protocol observed. Uh how do you how do you like this? Um uh, plus forward. Uh, okay. This is the the pointer here. And right. that's going forward. Right. My name is Dr. Wadi Singh. Um, while I was preparing for this talk, one of my friends who is the head of the... Um, we, I don't know if you know that there's the International Women's Groups in Botswana that's being held in Gaborone at this particular point. One of the ladies was telling me that in the representation here, I should, not, I should be gender neutral. So I took... Our football team is called the Zebras, the male football team. So I put those two Zebras, the male one and the female one, to just as a presentation of that, which was quite interesting. <laughs> now, let me start by first of all acknowledging the footballers of this world, past, present, and the future. Um, let me recognize Patrick A. Sinsulengwe. I saw his picture on the other side. Most of you don't know this, set, but he's one of the best footballers ever to come out of this continent to go overseas. He used to mesmerize us with his wizardry on the field. I have never actually watched him, but we used to listen to radio in a little radios in the middle of some tree in Botswana or using PM10 batteries. I don't know if any of you know those. Listen to what he was doing. The commentators from Radio Botswana from China were so good that it was like you are there along the stadium in, uh, in, in Soweto. Let me also recognize Respio Shabalala, who is the first man in the history of the universe, as we know it, to score a goal in uh, tournament, FIFA tournament held in Africa. It was a brilliant goal. Let me also recognize the children of the future, like that little girl, both male and females. I think it's quite important for the, f the female goals also to, to be recognized. Now, I'm going to divide my talk into four bits. It's because the first half, which is by medical support, uh, the second half, it's a, it's a, I mean, I've just left it out because it's a, it's a little bit of a surprise. Like in the olden days, we'd have these lucky packets from Africa, from South Africa. You open it, there's a, there's a special little thing inside it. So that's what it's going to be. The second half is I'm going to be talking about the PCMA, pre-competition medical assessment, which is quite important. And finally, injury time is going to be a question and answer session after everybody has spoken. That picture was in the 1990s in the, in the UK. The big chap like that, who is doing some maneuvering, is called Vin Jones. He was a footballer in the UK, an English footballer. He was extremely aggressive on the field. Now he's a, now a film star. He, 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 he's, um, uh, he's in Hollywood. And the type of roles he plays are exactly the same as he was in the field. There's normally a nasty chap, you know, the guy who is very aggressive. I mean, he's just as bad. The other one is called Paul Gasquin. We're going to talk about a lot of things. One of the things which um, I think is important is psychological support of players. Right, now, the picture on the, on the left, on the left there, that's Paul Cosco in the 1990s, 1996 um, uh, uh, UEFA Championship was in London. This guy was one of the best footballers to come out of England of that era. He was absolutely fantastic. Unfortunately, to 
due to lack of support. That's him on the right last year. You know, he gets up in the morning from a small flat. He goes off, calls a taxi, goes to the pub and buys a drink. And in fact, you know, there's another picture of him which I, want, I don't want to show it because, you know, you can't show it because he's just wearing underwear and, you know, he's just terrible. So one of the things we have to look into, in addition to what we are talking about here, is a long-term psychological support for players, the mental health in the long term. I think that's very, very important. In Botswana, I know there's a lot of problems, that, that, that the potentials for problems. Some of the, the players that I used to see in the 1990s, when I see them now, they're really in the back state, that type of state here. Yeah. I mean, recently in the uh, Commonwealth Games, some of our players, our, our uh, athletes won gold medals. A lot of money was given to them. Some of them are 18 years old. There's going to be a pressure, a lot of pressure on these people, and there's no support on it. And I think that's quite one of the things that you know, we should actually be, pay cognizance of. Now, I grew up in the UK from the, you know, from the age of 18 to about 38, 39. And um, uh, that picture on the left side, we've seen it already, Fabrice. I don't know exactly what I was doing at the time when this happened. I saw him fall down, and I knew he was dead, you know. I knew the guy was going to die because, first of all, you can see people are calling for help. Like he was talking, telling you about calling for help, perhaps it's not the first thing to do. You have to go on and resuscitate the ship. And unfortunately, as you know, he, he passed on. I've got a friend of mine who's a pathologist. He said to me once that a death of a person is not necessarily a bad thing. It can be a good thing. And the good thing is that the English FA, as a consequence of that, started training people to be aware of sudden cardiac death, such that many, many years later, with uh, uh, Fabrice Mwam, there were people there on board. They came in and resuscitated him. Yes, it took 78 minutes, but the fact is this guy is alive now. You know, he's completely alive. And the other thing that we learned from him is that even if you do screening, which happened in his case when he joined Tottenham, I mean, when he joined uh, Bolton, you have to keep doing it because things can develop after some time. That's what happened to, be, to him. And I think those are the kind of things that you guys have to be looking into. Now, you know, we talked about sports medicine team. Normally, basically, you need a whole team of people, not just doctors, you've got dentists, podiatrists, everybody. One of the more important people, in my view, is a social worker, because this is the kind of person that will be able to cancel the players, you know, to prevent what happened to Paul Gascoigne. So you need to hold people. And sometimes people tell me, we don't have these people. In Gaborone, we have every single person there is there in Gaborone. And I, in South Africa, I can give you $1,000 if you haven't got all those people in this country. All you have to do is to engage and try and call them to come and help out. Okay. So someone's going to talk about communication later. But that is a question of communication so that everybody understands that, you know, what you need to be done. Now, what do we do as doctors? We are there to ensure the availability of players so that the coach can Choose them. You know, you don't want to go to a tournament whereby players are injured. We want to make sure that to uh, nullify the negative impact of medical injuries and medical illness on, on the coach selection. Okay, so that's one of the most important things. The second most important, I mean, this is an advisory road. You cannot tell the coach this, you, know, you will not pick this person here, you will not pick this one. It's up to him. All we have to do is to be able to uh, advise him. That's why it's extremely important to have a good relationship with the, the coach, so that he has respect for you. Okay. The picture though at the bottom there is me and a gentleman called Professor Wallace. Professor Wallace was a, a professor of orthopedic surgery where I studied medicine in Nottingham many, many years ago. I used to go with him to Nottingham Forest Football Club, and I, I, used, to, he used, to, uh, I used to see him communicating with uh, uh, Brant Lath. I think all of you, may, some of you may know Brant Lath, one of the best, uh, um, they call him the best manager that England never had because she was absolutely brilliant. But he used to tell him, basically, this, is, this, this, is, this, patient, this, this guy is 90% fit. But that 90% fit does not uh, translate into 90% capabilities. It's not a direct relationship. He may be 90% injured, but then his performance will be much lower than that. We all know what happened to uh, David Beckham. He was injured, metatarsal problem. He, he was selected to go to uh, the World Cup in, in Korea, 2002. And what happened, somewhere in the midfield, some, you know, the ball came to him because he was a little apprehensive. He jumped like this. And out of nowhere, uh, 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 um, Ronaldinho took the ball like a rhinoceros, went through the misfield. 
went this way and just passed the ball over to Rivaldo and the game was over. And of course, he scored another goal later, but that was what happened. Because this chap, although he, he was much better, he was not fit enough to be able to play in that game. And the other, you know, I understand basically the, the Brazilian chap, what's his name? Nima has got a similar kind of problem. Right, the guy at the top there is part of the medical team. He's a traditional GP, he's extremely experienced, and he will tell you basically what's wrong with you by throwing the bones. He will also tell you how you're going to make sure you win that football game. So, I mean, I'm a sports physician by profession. The, the footballers who came to, say, to come to see me, maybe 90% of them have been to that guy, because I know, because when you look at their knees, whatever the injury is, little scratches on there. That's where that gentleman has been. <laughs> so make sure this chap is there because people believe in him, footballers. Not just in Africa, I know in Brazil they do too. He can also be intimidating to the other team too. When they see this guy passing through there, that's uh, the father of Manesh. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, 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 the rules for live licensing coming from FIFA, they're really straightforward, really. You must have at least one doctor and a physiotherapist to look after the first team. They must have some form of... Um, training in sports medicine. It doesn't have to be a master's in sports medicine, but courses like this are very, very helpful. And if you take away the word FIFA and put the local association, you know, you should have be thinking in these terms. These people are to provide medical support to the, uh, the, the team squad and also teach them on doping issues. They are supposed to pro they provide medical support at matches and also, most importantly, at training venues because often we forget about that. The gentleman who passed on a couple of years ago in Botswana, it happened at the training venue and he passed on because, you know, the, uh, our system was not uh, adequate not to be able to deal with that type of problem. The doctor must be recognized and certified by the appropriate national health authorities. So I can't come to South Africa from somewhere else and then practice here. I must be recognized as well. I don't know how you do things if I'm coming from Tunisia to play against, against Bafana Bafana as a physician. Do you allow me to practice or not? Because I don't know what the rules are here in this country. In Botswana, we have no rules either. Therefore, it's up to me to say, well, I'll look after him during that particular time. But in certain countries like Australia and New Zealand, they've got part of the legislation that you can give them an exemption to come and practice in the country. So that's quite important, there, right? Mm. The person must duly register to the, medical, the member association or league. That's where you can actually control who's going to look after your players. Because often the coach will take anybody to say, come and look after him. The chap that passed on in Botswana, there's a doctor who saw him. I, myself modify the, the PCMA from FIFA to CAF, same thing. But I don't believe it was followed through because when I was looking for information, it was not available. But no, I have no um, form of um, way of sanctioning people like that. But we're going to start working on this to make sure people are qualified to do the right thing. And you know, that's, that is extremely important. Now, can I ask you people a question? How many of these people on the right side, the supporters here, or anybody, the people I've listed here, left their home in the morning before the game saying that I am going to this football match to die? How many? Not a single one. Nobody is going to die. I'm going to die, man. So, so the whole system, our objective in this thing here is to make sure nobody goes there and dies. It's not a nice thing. I mean, I was devastated when the child died because, I mean, you know, I felt maybe I could have done something better. I could have insisted on certain things, but I didn't. But so, so it's very, very important. You've got team, team players, you know, both teams are quite important. You've got the football team officials, the referees, et cetera, et cetera, administrators and officials. The medical commissioner, the medical commissioner, the match commissioner, he doesn't want to go and die there. When the medical commissioner goes to look around here, he's going to be looking at those ambulances and everything because he knows... You know, you know, his head is on the block too. He may die if they're inadequate. So if he says, if he knows he's going to die, do you think he's going to say the mess can go ahead? No. So that, you know, those, those are the kind of people. And often you've got the, you know, the VIPs like uh, 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 our CEO here, who are all the VVIPs, you know. In the other day in Botswana, there was, a foot <laughs> there was a football match in Botswana, and then they did not allow me to go into the VVIP area. I just took it. So I said, okay, fine. I let the president, he will die if he collapses here. There's not going to be a doctor here. Goodbye. And remember, you are responsible. And immediately, they allow us to go into that area. <laughs> so the politicians, when you are going to have these large events, when they're going to be there, if they are playing around with medical issues, tell them that basically, if you collapse there, you're going to die because the next hospital is about a mile away. You know, that, 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 the things have to be make sure, make sure they're actually fine. They always look after themselves, okay? 
Because they can't take a helicopter and fly away to Europe like they usually do the politicians. Because if they're there, this has to be done right. Okay? Then, of course, the spectators. Those are very, it's very, very important. The spectators are, in, on average, are older. Some of them are older, and they are more likely to get the cardiac problems. So you need to have appropriate, appropriate trained people to deal with them. Now, forget about the picture. I mean, it's nothing to, at all. So that, 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 there's a criteria for the stadium. Okay. The stadium must be... <laughs> The stadium must be equipped, but must have um, the first aid room for spectators that are quite important. You need to have what's called crowd doctors. This came out of the Taylor Report in the UK. They talk about crowd doctors. I think for every 5,000 people, you need one doctor. There's a little, there's a book called The Little Green Book. So if you go into Google, put The Little Green Book uh, Crowd uh, 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 Medical Services. It will come down. It's free. You can download it. It tells you exactly how many first aiders you need. It's a, it's, a, it's a fantastic little book, okay? Yeah. Now, you need to have a doping room that must be near to the teams and referees place because, and it must be very, it must be private. Recently, we have a, a, a football match in Botswana, and they were put into, this thing was supposed to be in a small room, and the medical commissioner said no. So it has to be moved, and normally, one of you people should know what has to be in there, how it should be, so they can advise your football uh, te teams or host what is, needs to be done. FIFA, oh, there, there, there can be sport checks and sanctioned by this, the, 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 uh, uh, the Federation to make sure you're doing the right things. That's quite important, really. And uh, FIFA has the right to ask a confederation to carry sport checks. In other words, FIFA can say, okay, we're going to go and check what Kaiser Chiefs is doing. Do they have the right doctors? Are they qualified? That type of thing. They've got that, you know, the, the right to be able to do that. And if you don't, they could actually impose sanctions on you. Okay? At the football match, there's to be at least two fully equipped ambulances at least um, to the level of advanced life, life support. We, we recently had a football match, like I already talked there. When normally in Botswana, the, 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 you know the Zebras on play, I would go and check out the ambulances. And in the past, it had been Dr. Silas, ex-employee, who were doing this. And um, I know, you know him, I know the ambulances. They are always up to par. In this particular football match, I thought it was going to be him. Uh, I mean, that, that, that particular team, it wasn't. And I had made an assumption that I'm going to be there, and I wasn't. There were four ambulances there, which is over sub subscription. There were, some of them were ambulances just because you can see ambulance, nothing else. You, one of the ambulances did not have a spare wheel. Okay? If there's no spare wheel in the ambulance, what happens to the puncture when you're taking someone who's dying to hospital? A problem. The second one, the driver of the ambulance did not know where the jack is inside the ambulance. So those things are quite important. The other thing which we found that because, you know, these bags, you never use them. They're always there. There will be one time when you're going to use them. When we looked at the actual drugs inside them, they had expired. You see? So those are the things that are coming in terms of ambulances. One of the things that the medical commissioner said that you should have a memorandum of agreement with a local hospital where these people are going to go. We didn't. And he said, what if I collapse now? Where are you going to take me? You know? So he's thinking in terms of basically, you know, we've got to keep people alive. He's not going to die. We don't want anyone to die there. Okay? So, it doesn't have to be a memorandum of agreement. You can talk to the chief medical officer, and you can alert the, um, uh, the, the accident emergency department, get a letter or some form that are aware there's a football match going on, so they at least are prepared to do something in such an emergency. Okay? Right, let me see what else. Right, stadium safety. I think, you know, Dr. Sikila covered this quite nicely, but, you know, that's, that, you know, there was one football match at the Francis Town Stadium, that one, in, in northern Botswana. I went around just before the match. This stadium was designed with um, the, the right things in mind. They, had, they, they have a proper medical room where ambulance can reverse into. When I got there, they had made it into a commissioner's room, not a medical commissioner. So I had to negotiate with this guy from CAF, who's very important, to go and move the appropriate room and things like that, because those rooms were not labeled, and that, that, that's quite important. The good quality of medical service, I've already said, you know. Uh, ease of access in an emergency. This stadium was clearly designed by someone who, you know, the safety people that were advising, did not have any uh, uh, experience in stadium construction, because this is actually a death, death trap. I mean, if you go, I can't see here. I mean, here, you know the medical people are going to be somewhere here. 
Yeah. You can't reach just stand here if there's a mess here. You have to go around this way, come up from the top and this way. Even here, yeah, if someone is here, you have to go to reach this place here. You have to come from the other stand through there. And there's no sun poisoning. How to reach that thing? They've got barriers on the way here, which I think they should be removed. I've said that for a long time. Nobody has listened to us on this particular thing. Thank you. Right, ease of egress from, uh, from the stadium in an emergency, you know, to, to take someone from the top to put them down to the ambulance is quite important. Egress of ambulance from the stadium. Recently in Botswana, I was watching my football team on television play. One of the injured, uh, one of the players was injured, had an hamstring injury. They put, they took him out of the thing, did the normal first aid thing, put an ambulance to get out. As the ambulance was driving out, someone had parked that car right where it's supposed to go out. So this ambulance took 45 minutes to get out of the stadium. Imagine if it was, was sort of like a, a cardiac emergency or serious concussion. I mean, the person would have died, you know. So these are the kind of things that are important. So when I go to a stadium to have a look at this thing, they, there's normally someone close to their a security office of some form. I instruct him basically to make sure nobody packs in this area. So there's a clear way to get out. Those are little things, but, and they don't cost anything. They're very little things, but they can actually leave someone dying. I think, uh, I think that's because we are coming to, yeah. Now, the state of provision, emergency care for players. You, you need to have one emergency physician who has ALS capabilities and, uh, and paramedics in the player's medical room so that if there's a, they can actually resuscitate the patient properly. But I mean, it's not absolutely important, but that's one of the things that I actually picked up as it's one of the requirements. I mean, if you have a lot of other things happening, remember a lot of things can go wrong, but you know, it wouldn't be too much of a problem. Sideline medical team, this is the standard. For two groups of um, medical people, each consists of one doctor and three paramedics at the sideline. Okay. You got them there, you can see the four people there, the FIFA and the FIFA tournaments. There's the FIFA medical back on the side there. You got the stretches, the one at the back here, that Dr. Sikil was talking about too. Someone's got a head injury, there's a one, one in front there. So this is quite important. Once again, like you talked about basically the rehearsing and things like that, so that there's no confusion at the time of a medical emergency. Now, this is the halftime bit now. We finished about that type of thing. Okay, I, as I said, I come from Botswana. This is one of the most romantic places on earth here in the north of the country. <laughs> Honestly, I've been there, I know. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Kabango Delta. Uh, if you go on this thing, it's called a Mokoro. It's a duck out boat from a, a tea trunk. And it just goes in the base and nothing else around you. Yeah. It, it hardly ever happens. Occasionally, someone is grabbed by the hip hop, but you know that's extremely rare. I, mean, I think it happened maybe twice in the past 200 years, but you know, but worth just knowing. Botswana, the home of the big fives. These are wild animals. It's not the Gurkha National Park thing here. These are really wild animals. Marimi National Park. They're there in the wild. Okay, don't be fooled by that guy. That guy's one of my friends who grew up together. He likes going there. That picture on the right side, at the top left there. Don't be fooled by that. Those lions have fed. You don't go say, "Kuchi, kuchi, ah, so cute." They will kill you. <laughs> now, Botswana's got a simple rule: you are allowed to shoot these animals. It's not a problem. Don't mind at all. Shoot them, but with cameras only. <laughs> no rifles in the national parks. Okay, if you bring rifles into Botswana to shoot these animals. Please, please, please do not forget to have some form of identification so that the, 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 you know, the, 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 the wardens know where to send the body. Because they operate shoot to kill policies against poachers. So, so you're allowed to shoot them, just look at them, not to kill them. Okay? <laughs> right, Butson, I told you it's romantic, it's beautiful, it's fantastic country. Hey! I'm a, you know, does anyone know who this woman is? This one here. Obviously, I'm the oldest person in this room. That is Elizabeth Taylor. Elizabeth. And that one is Richard Button. They got engaged in the Okabango Delta many, many years ago. Beautiful. And of course, there's a wedding today in England. I have forgotten about that. That's Prince Harry and Meghan. They're getting married today in the UK. And the thing is, we have diamonds. We have diamonds, so many of them that basically we can give them to royalty. One of the, in, in one of the diamonds in here, I think, comes from Botswana. Okay? That thing, this big thing here, is not a simple stone, it's a diamond. 
it's the second biggest diamonds ever found in the history of the universe anyway. The other one apparently they say it came from South Africa, but I'm not buying that. But anyway. <laughs> It was called Sedilar Rona. It was sold last year in Southern London for 59 million American dollars. It came from a, a diamond mine that this gentleman used to work with at some stage. So if you search him very carefully, we live here, he might give you a diamond. <laughs> right, finally. Does anybody know who that is? Sorry? Ma? It's me! Ah, can you see? <laughs> Anyway, this is about coverage at the, this one is from, for the FIFA World Cup, which is in 2018 in Russia. Uh, it's an article 18 of this thing, of the World Cup. If you take away the word FIFA there and put local association, when you are going to be hosting tournaments and that type of thing, that's what you're in. Each participating member must carry out a PCMA on player pre uh, put, uh, competition medical assessment on all the players. And there's a whole form, which I'll go very quickly throughout because I don't think I have much time. You must confirm to FIFA that it's play, the players have undergone the PCA prior to the start of the final competition. And FIFA provides an assessment form that's available online. You just put FIFA PCMA on Google and it comes out. Or CAF PCMA, it comes up. It's exactly the same, there's no difference. Except that the FIFA one is more groovy. And I mean, it's got, you know, more, but the other one is just simple way. But <laughs> not the same. <laughs> Breach, the breach of this can be sanctioned by FIFA Disciplinary Committee. I think basically your, um, your, mem your association like SAFA should be able to, to, to make sure that the clubs are following this and then sanction as necessary. There are also other problems like, you know, nobody dying. You know, you've got extremes of weather. In Botswana, a couple of years ago, we were playing against, um, I think it was Mali. And it was extremely hot, and the match was supposed to start at 2 o'clock. And I argued that basically it should start much later on, which they agreed. And then they, they had like, you know, the cooling breaks where they had some water in the evening. And I even made um, a, 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 a broadcast on national uh, uh, radio so that people knew not to drink too much alcohol, to make sure they were the right clothes, that type of stuff. I think that's, that's quite important too. Responsibility for implementing controlling cooling breaks lies with the referees, up to the referee to decide that. But referees are very nice people. They're not not people, even though sometimes they, 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 they rule for the other team and they should be giving penalty for my team, they give the other team. It's not nice, eh? <laughs> okay, I think Kevin, yeah. Okay, the P, PCMA, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a long form. It's got, it just, basically it says lift, it's like saying lift your arm to the left, to the right, that type of thing is, but essentially it covers, you have to cover the medical history of the person, you know. Most nurses can do this quite easily because that's a full medical history. Because it tells you the questions to ask. You know, do you have a history of shortness of breath? Do you feel dizzy? You know, sometimes you get chest pains, that type of thing. Then you go through the previous medical problems. You go through the family medical history. I, like I said earlier, when I grew up in the UK, where if you ask someone, has anyone in your family ever collapsed? But like, well, they will tell you that um, yes, my mother had a heart attack or something like that. In Africa, they don't know. I don't know in Botswana, they don't seem to know what happened to their parents that they just passed on under, under suspicious circumstances. But if they said that, I assume that they had a cardiac problem until proven otherwise. There's a clinical <laughs> examination that any physician can do. But once again, it's a tick, 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 ticking on the whole form. And it's nice and easy. It's not, you know, it's, it's very, very easy to fill. Uh, then there's an orthopedic examination, which is quite expensive as well. There are some blood tests they recommend, you know, like food blood count, uh, user knees, uh, cholesterol, uh, 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 um, which I, I did talk to some people when I was at the medical conference in, in, in Geneva about that, but are this really necessary, but they seem to think they're necessary, but when you modified this in Botswana, we didn't include them because many people cannot afford this, really, because it becomes quite expensive if you go through all these medical tests that we're recommending. The ECG, I think everybody who's going to play a sport must have an ECG. Dr. Sigil has already talked about the ECG, the criteria and everything, and you know, it's, it's quite important. And I think the member association medical committee, when you are licensed in club, you must actually see the ECG itself. You must see a copy of this ECG to make sure it's done. We all know that sometimes there are some physicians that are a bit unscrupulous. They may just tick, tick, tick without having done the, 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 this ECG. The echo, once again, the echo can be a very expensive business. In Botswana, it, uh, an echo costs about 1,500 to 2,000 bula to do. 
once again, I don't know whether it's a, it's a routine it should be done, but for the more richer clubs, I think it should be, it's necessary. But the poorer club, perhaps maybe you can get away without doing it. But if this ECG is abnormal, I would go towards the echo. If you don't know how to interpret an Atlas CG, ECG, you should try and seek help from someone else because a lot of people can actually help you out. In South Africa, in South Africa, we send our patients here, so you know, it should be good. Uh, they should be able to help you with that. I think that's probably coming towards the end. So basically, like I said, nobody goes to a football match to die. And we want to make sure players are healthy, all of them are, uh, are picked. That goalkeeper is one of the most you know, entertaining goalkeepers I've ever seen. I watched a football match sometime uh, in, the, in the UK where Colombia was playing against England. And uh, uh, Gareth Salga hit a ball from just outside the 80s. This ship instead of just catching it like this, he did this tumble thing and hit it with, you know, with his legs like that. And then I found that he's done the same thing again before in, um, in, um, um, in Colombia. And this one dances with bottom, you know, I don't know how he does it, you know. From the <laughs> and you know when he retired, that the next one also when they score goal, he was doing the same thing. <laughs> and um, you can see the best of the future of football. A lot of the people will start like this, and in the end, they will end up like those top three there. I thank you very much for your attendance. <laughs> Dr. Risang, thank you very much for that informative uh, talk. Uh, we will come and visit Botswana <laughs> at some stage or the other. I've been invited by a few guys. Um, next up, we have Lerato. Lerato Mguni is a mental trainer. There's a very special passion of mine, the mental aspect of the game, uh, especially football as well. And I think we somehow sometimes fail from a medical side to pay attention to this medical aspect of things. Uh, she basically has been the founder of Quesa Sports Science Academy where they have been involved with a lot of development of mental training skills and physical training skills as well. Uh, she does stuff for a non-profit organization where they develop in uh, female golfers as well. And she was involved with developing the first female PGA accredited uh, golfer, uh, golf uh, coach, in fact. She's worked with uh, School of Excellence, uh, Sundown's uh, female team as well, and she's also involved in some conditioning at a academy in Orange Farm as well. So with that said, I'd like to call upon Lerato to come and talk to us about football psychology. Thank you very much. Yes, it's on. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, good it's day, yes. <laughs> good day, everyone. Uh, I would firstly like to greet the CEO and thank him for this opportunity that he has made for all of us. Thank Dr. Ngwenya and his team that they work effortlessly for us to be here. Uh, this is one of the... I would say the animal, the beast, we, they don't like us, I would say. Our profession, most coaches, between you and me, they don't like us. Reason being, they think that our, pro our profession, we come to take their job, but actually we come to work with them. Because as much as you can be physically trained and be phys physically fit, you need to be mentally fit. And I would say, actually, this is one of the field that is overlooked most of the time. Uh, one of the guys that I was working with, especially in the townships, and then they will ask me, oh, si mara hagitani. You understand? Like, I'm not crazy. What do you want? I'm not crazy. I'm not, I don't need a shrink. I'm fine. I'm not crazy. It, yes, I'm not saying you're crazy, but you need this. But no, I just want to play soccer. I just want to do this. I say, okay, fine. Let me give you a scenario. Um, I love to do this example. When we, when we looked at the match of Bra Brazil at the World Cup, and it was Mexico when they lost. One of the reasons that 
one of the reasons that you would have to check the mental toughness of them, and this actually they made a stats about it. And okay, let us not take Brazil. Let us take the recent when Pirates and Super Sport 6 nil. We all we all saw that, right? So yeah, let us take the recent one. Let us leave Brazil out. <laughs> Pirates, 6 nil. Uh yeah. <laughs> Six nil. Usually, our the tradition of our boys in soccer, they they sing. We all know that they sing, and they're hyped up. We're going to do this, and in the tunnel, you would see even their facial expression, how they are so happy, and how are how are they well prepared for the game, and then they would get in, and we we're looking at pirates, right? And then they got in, and then the whistle started, and they started playing. They started playing, 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 one nil. Oh, we can still come back, right? They started playing, 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 two nil. Ah, we are coming back. <laughs> we are coming back for them. Playing, 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 three nil. Ash. Four nil. Ah. Five nil. You could already see the body we, you could already see when they tackle the body, when, they, when their body tackle the, 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 the ball, their ball position, you could already see them, how it has decreased. You see how they receive the ball, how the confidence, the commitment, it's already gone. We lost. We lost. But someone would say, I'm fine. That, those players would say, I'm really fine. I don't need you. But they do need us. Where do w the coach is sitting on the touchline, right? Can they come and say you can still do it? Most of the most of the time, the coaches are flipping angry. They are angry. Most of the time, the, when the team is losing, the coach does not say, "No, you made a mistake. Keep on going. Keep on going. We can still do this." No. Why didn't you see that? Go close there. Do that. Do that. And at that time. I, I told this other coach that which player or which person would want to disappoint their family, their friends, girlfriend, the coach, everyone. Think about it. Which player would not want to be the first startup next season or next game? No one. But most of the time, players do not, coaches do not consider that. And most of the time, in this, when I say most of the time, coaches do not consider that. I speak mostly in the development, in the grassroots, because I've been exposed more there than in your PSL and your NDF. And your, but when you go to the grassroots level, trust me, it's bad. Coaches do not have this knowledge about mental toughness. So with that being said, we're going to talk about four C's that are help us to en enhance performance for the players. And these are the words that we usually use most of the time. Almost every day, we use that. It's control, confidence, challenge, and commitment. One would say, I know these things. One would say, I always... I always talk about this. Most of the time, coaches, when they have their team talk, they talk about this. But they never train the players mentally about that. We'll go to control. Control is the ability for one to be able to feel in control in their lives. And I loved what the doctor, Dr. Lesejo, spoke about, that whenever there's a situation in the ground, and with that other video, there was panic everywhere. Where does that come from? Everyone was panicking. Everyone is not thinking straight. Everyone thinks, no, let us do this, let us do that. But who is in control? No one is. So we have in the mental toughness, we have arousal and performance. Arousal and performance are directly proportional to each other. If you are lazy and you want to work out and you start working out, uh, let me just do it, uh, bicycle crunch, you're just doing it. Really, the performance, because the effort is not there, it's not really great, right? But when your arousal is high, 
and also your performance will be high. So this is what we look at and we have the inverted U graph that shows us that it is important for each and every player to be aroused. But how do they get aroused? That is, that is another topic again. And then we have PMR. This one I would like us to do this one. Uh, the Dr. Leseho again spoke about recognize. That word recognize is very important in the sporting field. Can we please just all relax and put your notepad down and your pen down? Just for a minute. You won't do funny things, trust me. <laughs> Thank you. So what I would ask you to do right now is just tense up your muscles, like squish them hard. Relax, tense them up, relax. Thank you. This is another technique that we use, that players use. If you are able to re recognize your body when it's tensed up, you are able to psych yourself up. So players do, most players do not recognize when they, when they are tensed up and their and anxiety goes up, then what happens? Their performance drops. It goes back to arousal and performance. And then we have central breathing. Central breathing helps with the level of, of concentration, the heartbeat, and how they breathe. So if a player is used to the technique of doing the central breathing, the player will, will be able to recognize that my level of concentration is low. Now I need to psych myself up. And when I say psych myself up, it's a pre-competition or pre-routine pre that they do and they get used to it. And now a player is able to detect his own body without being told. And that is very important. And then I've already mentioned pre-competition pre routine. And then we have commitment. Does uh, this say, how are you going to get it sitting in the corner? Most of the guys, when you go to the township, I'll make uh, an example to the township because I love to be in touch with the real people, you understand? Because with, <laughs> when I say the real people, I mean that we, they're the one that facing a lot of problems. They're the one facing with a lot of things that when you go to your urbans and, 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 and most of the time, yes, they still have problems, yes, but because of the economic status and lack of knowledge, and you see that they face more, I would say, more problems than the urbans one. So I'm sorry about that, but when, when, what I said about this other guy would sit in the corner and say, I want to drive a Lamborghini. And they will keep saying that for the next coming 10 years, sitting in the corner. What will happen? This other guy that I was working with at School of Excellence, he's actually, I think, 17 years old. And I asked him a very important question, what is your goal? What is your goal? And he looked at me and said, I want to be the best in the world. And I asked him, how are you going to do it? He said, I don't know. That is the reality of our players. Our players want to go to PSL, but they don't know how to get there. Then we have a goal, set, goal setting that we use, which is a, we use the acronym of SMART, SMART goal. Players have to be specific with their goals. They have to know that I want to go to PSL and who, what, where, and why I'm doing this. That is very important. And our players do not have that. Pl do not even think about why they are even playing sports. They're just doing it. And then we have measurable. Measure your goal. It's very important to measure your goal. It's very extremely important. And then we have achievable. But usually we use action orientated. Which actions a player sh will be taking to achieve their goal? Relevant, we usually use realistic. Players must be realistic with their goals. And then we have town bound, which they have to have target, targeted dates in which they will write down. And this is a whole, I would say, a program that could take close about four months. That's how important. Mental toughness does not take two days. You don't call us in three weeks before competition 
and think that the players will be psyched up. It's very important because it's a habit. When someone is smoking, you cannot just say stop smoking and then tomorrow they've stopped. It's a process. One of the stats that I was reading, up, uh, reading about mental, tough, mental illness is that 75% of children are faced with mental toughness before they reach 18 years old, and we don't know about it, and which is depression and anxiety. It is a disease, and people don't know about it. There's, you, when you look at the social media pressure that you see your, your, your friend wearing a Nike and you want it, and you, that, that child does not tell you that, Daddy, I want this, this Nike because he knows you don't have money. So they decided to do what? They start being depressed. They start cutting themselves, you don't even know. And more, uh, the shocking, shocking stats that the UK did is most of the time when it's recognized the mental toughness is usually with violence and someone has already taken their lives. That's where we can see. And it's in incredible shocking. And then we have challenge. Uh, this is my favorite quote. You can't do anything that you can't picture yourself doing. Once you make the picturing process conscious and deliberate, you begin to create the self you want to be. Most of our players, it's very important to know who they are, their identity. They don't know who they are. They are lost. Hence, one of the, one of the, one of the things that I've shown this other doctor is, if you can look at our South African players, and which is the doctor also with the first uh, player that he showed us that he was one of the best in UEFA, and now he, you saw what happened to him. Why? Most of, uh, most of our players, we have the best player, and then they vanish. We don't know where they are. We don't know what happened. It's a problem because they don't see themselves in the future. And then there are three processes that we use. It's mental, mental practice, mental rehearsal, and mental review, which is visualization. We help them. Most, most of players and most athletes use that one. And to tell you the truth, each and every one of us have done it before, but we have never been intentional about it. The sooner as you become intentional about it, the more it, it is effective on your life. This is other my, my, um, my favorite quote again. Whatever you hold in mind on a consistent basis is exactly what you will experience in your life. What you think is what you, it's what you become. Simple as that. So our players, what they think is for them, if I can drive that GTI, that's it. They don't think beyond that. If I can get that girl, that's it. They don't think beyond that. It's, on, it's, it's true, and it's sad. Because at the end of the day, we don't have players that after they have played and their time, they, get, they reach with 35, we only have few players that maybe go to coaching and continue with their life, but most of them, they just vanish. Out of 10, you would get most probably, it's not an accurate state. <laughs> Out of 10, maybe you will get four. four. And then we have the last one, confidence. This one is, I would just mention the, the game that was playing during the week, Barcelona and Sand, Mamelodi Sundowns. It was extremely, extremely a beautiful game to see our boys in that level of confidence playing against the best in the world. Confidence is important. Players need to be confident. Players need to be taught how to be confident, no matter what, that it is impossible. You can do this. And we have self affirmation and what's that? Self affirmation and self talk that we help players to actually become confident with who they are. And these are the things that mostly we know about, we talk about them, but we are not intentional about them. It is said that. When we are more spiritual, we are the most intelligent human beings. When we are more is spiritual, we are the most intellig intelligent beings. So the more you recognize who you are, your inner being, 
the more you can talk to yourself, the more you can talk to your subconscious, the more, y- there are three things that usually happened, happens in life. It's, it's either you're in the past, in the present, or in the future. And one of the reasons why we are always depressed is why we we're in the past. I shouldn't have done that. And one of the reasons why we are always anxious is because I want to get there. But we, we hardly in the present. What the, mi- what, what the mind can believe and conceive it can achieve it. So it's important what we think and what our players think and what we feed our players is very important. So with all of this and all of what I have shown you, what can we achieve? Performance anxiety, improvement in mental skills, preparation for, for competition, pre-game and pre-shot competition routines, sorry, improvement in practice efficiency, RTP, after injury, coping with social pressures. These are the things that if you have those four components and tie them with the mental toughness technique, you will get in a player or in a team. With that said, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you, Larato, for that uh, very informative talk. Uh, I'm sure we'll all go back with some uh, lessons learned here to realize what the importance of the mental aspect of the game is. Saying all of that, uh, it's close to lunchtime now. And we're not going to have lunch now, but we're going to have someone who's going to make us feel like we want to have lunch. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Daddy Matthews, who's a dietitian uh, by profession. He's been involved with the Department of Health for several years, involved with sports as well for many years. And apparently he runs 15 kilometers a day. Uh, oh, sorry, three times a week. So maybe we've, we've taken one day out of his week today, so we're sorry for that. So tomorrow you've got to do 30 kilometers. Uh, at present, he works at Michael House School Sports Academy, and uh, he's previously presented some stuff on nutrition to the South African referees as well. And I think with us as being practitioners within the team setting, where we don't have the privilege of always having dietitians amongst us, I think it's well worth the while for us to pay attention to some of the information he has to share. So with that, uh, Mr. Daddy Matthews. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and I also want to just say thank you to um, Safa for inviting me to come and just share with you the importance of nutrition for players. Um, you are well aware that with increasing uh, physical demand on players, uh, teams have got to really uh, come up with strategies that will aid players um, to be healthy, to recover quickly, because you know that they are playing games almost after every three or two days, uh, to recover quickly and also to just perform optimally. So um, the presentation that I'm going to be taking you through, um, it's what needs to be done um, for each and every player um, who is playing um, in, the P- in the PSL. Um, as, as I was driving this morning, um, I forgot to take my breakfast because I, I traveled from Polokwane. So I forgot to take my breakfast. And um, I think I was almost 150 kilometers away from Polokwane. And I just switched off on the road. I couldn't see anything. Um, fortunately, um, the incoming traffic was quite a bit far. It was a bit blurred. I couldn't see anything. Uh, On my side, there wasn't any car coming. Uh, With the blurredness that I was in, I had to just get out of the road um, and then from the stop, switch off the car, get out of the uh, out of the car, and and then just breathe. Um, So I thought um, um, I always tell people that you shouldn't do anything or wake up and go and do anything without having had breakfast. So um, that happened to me this morning. Um, So please make sure that you don't do anything without having had breakfast for that day. Now, I'm going to be um, uh, uh, basing 
on my presentation on the FIFA consensus statement that was presented um, on, um, on the 2nd of September 2002. Um, and Pele also, as I'm quoting him, he was saying that good nutrition um, has much to offer for soccer players, coaches, and also clubs. So it's important that our players also understand that without good nutrition, they will not be able to perform uh, optimally. Now, with the determinants of soccer performance, we know that for you to perform very well, uh, you need to have uh, physiological genetics or you need to be able to, you know, it's genes that are propelling you to also perform very well. You need enough training. You need to be trained very well in what you're doing. You also need to be monitored. And I'm very happy that um, Safa is also taking that initiative to make sure that players would, will be tracked will be monitored in order for us as professionals to help them and to also assist them. You need the psychologist. Um, you heard what she was saying also. It's important that um, the, the, you know, the, 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 the mental health of players is also put uh, at the forefront. A lifestyle, all of our players also need to, or want to have a beautiful girlfriends. Um, they also want to drive beautiful cars. Um, and we must also put them um, in, the, in, in, that, you know, in that frame of saying that even though you want to have all these things, you want to have a good lifestyle, you still need to make sure that you perform on the ground. Um, health injuries also, um, also contributing towards your performance. If you don't, um, if you are injured and um, um, you are off the ground and you don't eat properly, you'll end up uh, not recovering very quickly. The last one that it's being missed very well and very much by most of the teams and most of the coaches, clubs, it's, it's the part of nutrition. Nutrition really plays an important part in maintaining the player's health um, and also uh, positively affecting uh, performance. Um, this morning when I arrived here, I was very happy um, to see that um, that's tea um, and that's also um, uh, fruits. Um, um, and I was saying, you need, you know, I, I, I wish I could have spoken to, um, to Dr. Uh, Tulani to say that, Doc, um, I would appreciate if you could spoke, if you could have spoken to me exactly what the participant should have in order for us to, pre to preach the good message that we want to preach to everybody. Now, when it comes to the science of soccer, uh, we all know that soccer is an intermittent uh, team sport um, where uh, players, or it's characterized by repeated bouts of short duration, high intensity sprints, jumping, heading, and also kicking, uh, all of those things are combined with moderate intense, um, uh, intense exercise. Um, unfortunately, it requires maintenance of skills and also decision making. We know that players are actually cover, covering quite a lot on the ground, or approximately 8 to 13 kilometers uh, on the ground during the 90 minutes, including the extra time. During that time, we all know that um, Due to the fact that they are running, they are actually losing quite a lot of, of salt, losing quite a lot of water, um, and also um, the salt that they are losing affect, will also affect their, um, their performance. Ultimately, the sweat loss um, that they are losing is an attempt for the body to dissipate heat resulting in dehydration. So we also need to be looking at those kind of things for all of our players. We need to make sure that our players are in good hydrated state uh, when it comes to, to, the, to the playing. Again, we are also well aware that both uh, aerobic and anaerobic energy systems um, are utilized during soccer, uh, with aerobic um, energy system being dominant. Uh, we're also aware that during the in, in, uh, uh, increased intensity, that's when the anaerobic um, energy system starts to kick in. Ultimately, that you find that players are really expending quite a lot of energy on the ground. For men, approximately 1,500 um, uh, 1, kilocalories are lost when they are on the ground as they are running and playing. For women, it's almost uh, 1,000 kilocalories that are, that, are, that, are, that are expended on, on the ground on that match. Now, it is important that coaches, physiotherapists, and the medical team within within the, the teams um, make um, uh, or you, they must actually go to an extent of making it imp important or also consideration or considering to make sure that whatever they do with the players, they train the energy systems in 
good in a in a good way know how to train them when to train them and also what to to train when it comes to the energy systems and therefore anything that the players put into their mouth when where how much um they eat and drink will really affect the way they perform on the ground. It is important also that we incorporate the issue of nutrition periodization, which is also very important for them to know that carbohydrates are important for their performance and how they can uh, periodize their eating plan um, uh, for them to perform very well. It is therefore important as players are making an effort uh, to, to train very hard and to make sure that they perform very well on the ground. It's important for them also to take the same effort when it comes to eating. They have to have eating strategies in order for them to perform very well on the ground. You know, unfortunately, coaches, players, and, and team management sometimes and neglect nutrition and that's one of the mistakes that most of the clubs and the teams are committing and are making and players result um, in performing poorly on on the ground the first mistake that players are making one is what i made this morning i skipped my breakfast now the challenge is the players will tell you that they really do not have enough time to have breakfast like i woke up at about four o'clock in the morning and I thought for me to arrive at, uh, on time, uh, it would be good for me to drive and I'll see what I'll, what I'll eat on the, road, on the road. Unfortunately, I did not have time uh, to eat on the road. Sometimes also players will tell you, we don't really find time in the morning for us to have breakfast. Some, some of them will tell you, I don't feel like eating in the morning. Um, if I wake up at 8 o'clock, uh, I'll probably have my breakfast at about uh, 11 o'clock. Some of them have got misconceptions of losing fat. If, um, if, if, if I don't eat breakfast, it means then um, my body weight will come down um, and also my muscle mass will, come, will go up when I'm training and they end up not, not eating breakfast at all. That's also simply um, a habit with, with most of the players. Um, and also what I've seen with the children that I'm working with at Michelle House Academy, some of them also come to the, to the ground on Saturdays without, without having had breakfast. They'll tell you that, well, I don't feel like eating uh, at home. We don't eat breakfast at this time because I'm here on the ground. Um, a breakfast, sometimes it's eating at about 11 o'clock or, 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 or 12 o'clock uh, in, the, in the afternoon. So it's, it's, it's it's, it's a habit for them to do, to do that. Now, skipping breakfast is associated with adverse uh, health, um, health effects, uh, including one, you have increased body fat levels. Uh, if, you, if you miss your breakfast, remember that the next meal is going to be a hoo-ha. It's going to be quite a lot that you're going to eat. On your plate, is going to be huge. Um, your plate is going to be huge because you're compensating for what you did not have during breakfast. So it's important that players also understand if they don't, if they don't take breakfast, they're going to end up um, eating more in their next meal. The other thing is cardiovascular diseases. Um, because you are not eating, ultimately when you're going to eat, you're going to end up eating fatty foods because you are craving for fatty foods at that time. The other challenge is players will tell you that they will only eat breakfast after, after, after training. Now, if you have fasted, all of us we know if you fast uh, or overnight fa fasting will lead to a drop in your uh, your, your liver glycogen, um, or 20 to almost 20 grams will be gone compared to um, a, a hundred or approximately 110 that should be that should be in your liver. That um, liver glycogen, we know that it maintains a constant uh, blood, blood glucose concentration. Now, if you end up with um, um, low uh, uh, blood glucose, you become dizziness, as I, as I, as I started in the, in, in the morning, um, nausea, and also inability to, 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 to concentrate. Now, imagine if those players come to training and they don't eat their breakfast. They'll end up being dizzy. Some of them will be nauseous, and some of them will also have an inability to concentrate in what the coaches are giving them. Ultimately, the complications will lead to training not being as supposed to be. They will not perform very well. And this can, can result in the body uh, being catabolic, resulting in protein loss and lean body mass. And you don't want your players to lose their lean body mass. You always want them to, uh, their body composition to be, to be very well. 
the solution one to overcome this players need to make sure that they have carbohydrate as their backbone during breakfast and not really too much eggs because we've seen some of the players will tell you because I want to have uh, 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 my, my muscle mass um, I'll have lots and lots of proteins. I'll have a protein shake and I'll not have anything else except that. And they go and have um, a go for training. So it's important that they really have carbohydrate as their backbone. If they're going to train for a longer period, it's important that they have at least seven to 10 grams per kilogram body mass of carbohydrate. And um, if we work them that one out for you, um, it will be quite a lot of energy that you're putting into your body. The second thing is to make sure that breakfast is consumed at least or approximately uh, an hour prior to uh, training sessions. You don't want your players to come to training sessions with uh, the stomach uh, being full and also um, um, irritating them as they are running um, in the ground. The, thing, the third thing is for them to be able to consume enough energy to meet their daily energy expenditure from, from training. So it's important that when they come to training, they have had enough of carbohydrate in order to make sure that they, cons uh, they continue with the training also. The other solution is to consume low glycemic index carbohydrate and moderate, uh, moderate protein. Now, um, if they come to, uh, to, to training having consumed white bread, white bread has a uh, glycemic index, it's very, very high. Once it gets into your stomach, it's digested very quickly, and within, with, within a very short space of time, you're, you're hungry once more again. So they need to consume at least low glycemic index um, um, carbohydrate in order for them to make sure that it, 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 it sustains them for quite some, for quite some time. The second thing that um, the second mistake that players are, are, are doing is chronic dehydration. So they come into they come to the ground without having um, uh, taken anything to drink. Um, uh, many players have demonstrated a consistent level of dehydration you, um, when we were using the urine osmolarity. So the, ur the urine osmolarity that we use is to st to, it's actually to test how um, hydrated players are. Uh, some of the players we found that their um, urine or osmolarity was almost close to about 100 to 300 um, 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 uh, osmolarity, so which is very, very, very low, and that's that's very, very, very dangerous. Um, it's supposed to be at about 900 to 1,000 os osmolarity. That will result in dehydration, and we all know that dehydration uh, players will end up with reduced blood volume, um, increased uh, Core, core temperature, increased rate of gly uh, gly glycogen uh, oxid oxidation, and therefore a uh, decreased sweat rate, which will lead to um, less stamina, um, and ultimately the work output will also be decreased. Uh, skills, also uh, passing skills within within the ground will also decrease. Uh, decision making also will also be decreased within the ground, and therefore there will be an impaired performance and ultimately fatigue will kick in very qu very quickly towards the end of the game and your players will not perform uh, to their to their uh, to their um, um, uh, optimum uh, performance the solutions that we have it's it's to have hydration strategies one in general this is what we say at least drink ap approximately 500 ml of fluid uh, with each meal of the day it can be water uh, probably we're saying water is the best um, medicine so we always ask them to act actually have at least 500 ml of fluid um, um, uh, with each meal secondly for them to drink additional 2 liters throughout the day as they are uh, performing or uh, uh, training um, th thirdly is to monitor the urine color and, uh, and also odor to make sure that um, they can see whether they are hydrated or dehydrated. Uh, uh, fluids to be lower than the ambient temperature. If cold, it's much, much better as compared to lukewarm uh, because then you become very nauseous when you get uh, tap water just as, as is. Um, when you're training very hard, you need to get at least um, a very cold uh, 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 water in order or fluids in order for you not to become nauseous as you are continuously training. The other one that says that um, uh, uh, weigh yourself or uh, players need to weigh themselves before training and also after training in order for them to see exactly how much uh, um, uh, weight or water they have, they have actually lost. For matches and also for training, we're saying for them um, as recommended uh, and recommendations is to drink 500 ml of fluid approximately two to three hours pre-training. 
um, in order for them to really be uh, hydrated and for them uh, to make sure that the engine becomes uh, well. You know that the car also cannot run without water. You need to make sure that the car runs with water at all times in order to feel to make it to make it cooler. During training, um, they need to also start drinking early uh, and aim to drink at least 250 mils per 15 minutes. Um, while they are training. Um, and you have also seen that FIFA has also introduced the issue of players um, uh, that players uh, can, can also just drink at any time they want to drink. If they can move towards the, the sideline, they can get water if they, want to, if, if they also want to drink. If training is also taking more than an hour, uh, we need to make sure that players get at least a carbohydrate-containing drink, which is sometimes the sports drinks. Uh, in South Africa, we've seen quite a lot of children, almost three years, four years, are being given Enegade, Powerade, and these are sports drinks. Uh, they are not juices. Um, you, don't, you can't just give it to um, any other person who is not going to be exercising to just take it. What are you taking it for? Because that's a sports drink. And children become very active um, after drinking this. And the you, mothers, um, um, mothers at home um, um, then you know, want to wonder why these children are not really sleeping at, that, at, at the right time. Because they've taken quite a lot of energy at that, at that time that they, do, they, that they do, do not need at all. Um, at halftime, it's also crucial uh, for them to replenish um, their, their fluids and also the sweat losses. Um, a sports drink will also do, even water can do, but we normally recommend that a sports drink become the first because then you're replenishing all of the glycogen that you have lost during the time uh, that you were in the ground and also the sodium that you have lost uh, during the time that you were in the ground. Sports drinks are the best and convenient way to ingest fluids and also carbohydrates. This is how we then say to players, if you want to see how hydrated you are, you can then use that chart to monitor your, your urine uh, sample that you take. Or if you go to the loo, look at, your, look at your, your urine. If it's a number eight, you know that you are very dehydrated. From number five, coming to number eight, you, be, you are becoming dehydrated. At least from number three going up, number four going up, you are hydrated and there's nothing wrong with, you, with your hydration. The other challenge that we um, um, players um, or mistakes that players are doing it's a poor pre or game a meal. Uh, the challenge is the purpose. We know that the purpose of the pre-game meal is to top up our liver and also mus muscle uh, glycogen in ensuring that the pre-game hydration it's 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 there also at at all times. Secondly, some players regard uh, the meal or the pre pre-game meal as, um, as, 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 as a performance meal and they end up overeating. Uh, you find that they're sitting on a plate, uh, sitting on, on a table at home and you, can't, you cannot see them on the other side because the plate is a bit bigger because they want to over, over, over eat. So they need not overeat at all. They need to make sure that they eat per portions, um, which is very important. Three, overeating leads to digestion uh, problems and also absorption problems, uh, causing bloating. They come onto the ground being bloated, uh, or some, some of them will actually also feel very discomfort. The solutions, one, it's for pre-game meals to be consumed at least three to four hours um, before the game. Um, players also need to be advised to, to consume at least low glycemic index meals, uh, low fat, and also low in, in fiber. Uh, because you don't want them to also become uh, uh, irritated uh, because of the fiber that's, in, that's in, their, in their stomach. They also need to avoid high fat. Some of our players will, before the game, maybe go and get a gota or a spatula. Um, and they end up having quite a lot of fat, or a pie, uh, which, is, which is also having quite a lot of fat. Uh, Cream-based sauces, uh, high protein also, especially red meat, um, it takes quite a long time to be digested. Uh, so if they take red meat also, it will, it will also bother them in their stomach. Large portions of fruit that contains a lot of fiber also will irritate or cause irritation in their stomach. So it's important that they also take uh, fruits, fruits that do not have a lot of fiber in, in them. Um, they also need to consume at least 500 mils of water or any other juice, uh, preferably apple, apple juice because it, it also, it's, it's also light, low glycemic index uh, or electrolyte-based sports drink with, with, with the meal that they are taking. 
They also need to use um, carbohydrate-based snacks. Uh, in our South African language, when we talk about snacks, we don't mean peanuts, uh, zimbas, and any other thing. We're talking about any other thing that you can snack in. It either It's either a yogurt, a banana, or a sandwich. Um, 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 that's what we mean when we talk about a snack. Uh, low glycemic index food uh, also offer an advantage uh, as compared to high glycemic index. And I've given you an example that brown bread can be a low, it's a low glycemic index as compared to a white bread glycemic in, uh, uh, white bread which is a high glycemic index. So it's important that when they want to have low glycemic index, rather than taking white bread, they can take um, a brown bread. However, some players have uh, their own uh, pre-game routine, so we need to exercise uh, patients when we speak to them and when, when we recommend some of the food that we recommend for them. Um, the other mistake that um, they make, it's a, a post-poor match uh, game meal. Uh, the challenge is some of the players will tell you that, um, you know, they are actually making a conscious decision that after each and every game that they, have, they are going to play, they are not going to be eating immediately after the game. Uh, because we do have a window period within which protein uh, resynthesis occurs and also be within which glycogen um, resynthesis also occurs within or the building up of glycogen within your muscles and also your liver also occurs at that time. Uh, for 24 hours to 48 hours after the game or the training, it's imper imperatively crucial to replenish mus uh, muscle glycogen stores and it becomes important if there's another game in two to three days. And that is why most of the players find it very difficult when they come to either training or to, uh, to play in two, three days' time. It's very heavy for them to play because they have not really replenished their glycogen, uh, mus uh, muscle glycogen as quickly as possible with, within the window period, which is 24 to 48 hours. Neglecting this after 42 hours uh, after the game, muscle glycogen will still have not returned to almost 100% as it should be, which is very disastrous for most of the players that are going to be taking or playing in three days' time. Uh, the solutions that we have for them, one, um, it's important that um, each and every club at least have what we call a recovery nutrition strategy, um, which, is, which must be in place to facilitate the replenishing of one of muscle and, and, and liver glycogen. So immediately after the game, uh, players need to know that they need to either go into the dressing room or immediately after the game, they need to be, uh, as they move um, out of the pitch, maybe somebody else uh, who is an administrator throw um, a power rate or any other uh, carbohydrate containing a drink for them so that they can um, they can have, or you can just have milk, or you can, you can give them a banana, or you can give them a yogurt uh, for them to quickly replenish their muscles, uh, uh, muscle glycogen. The other thing, it's for them to replenish their fluid and electrolyte lost during the, uh, the, the game through sweat um, and also to accelerate muscle damage repair as quickly as possible so that they can prepare themselves for the next coming game and also promotion of protein synthesis all this uh, will help players not to have um, um, or their immune system will not be depressed because once their immune system de is depressed because of the training, remember that as they are training very hard, their immune system becomes uh, depressed and therefore or suppressed and therefore they can uh, have um, uh, or, con or contract any other kind of uh, diseases that's, that's around them. If it's flu, they can catch the, the, those kind of uh, diseases as quickly as possible. The other solution um, we have also seen is, you, you know, there are many factors that determine the success of the nutrition recovery, uh, recovery strategy. One, it's all of us, all, and also uh, my, uh, dietitians or nutritionists that are within the club will have to also look at the facilities that are available um, uh, within, if you are playing away, you need to know exactly where what is, like doctor was talking about. If you are a doctor, you don't have the privilege of really watching the game. You need to be examining where the other things are in order for you to make sure that when something happens, you are quick to react. So it's important that we also make sure that those facilities are in place. You need to also know exactly the timing of when uh, the, the other kind of food that we need to give to players need to be given and when to, to be given. The 
quantity and also the GI of the food that we're giving to players and also that the players are consuming. And lastly, the energy demand of the game uh, and also which is sometimes it can be very high, which uh, includes the extra, the extra time. So it's important that uh, food and drinks uh, that players are taking should be available immediately after the game um, through a variety of post uh, of carbohydrate and protein rich drinks and snacks. It can happen in the dressing room. Uh, you can see that I've, I've, I've put uh, 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 veg uh, vegetables and fruits uh, there. When they get into the dressing room, they can pick any other fruit they want to eat um, that it's that it's on the table. Uh, you can have um, a, a, a milk um, a close to, uh, close to them. You can have yogurt. You can have banana, so that they can just pick those things or um, a carbohydrate uh, drinking. Uh, 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 drink so that they can just take quickly and, and, and drink because that's a window period between um, when the replenishing can, can be done. Now, the solutions are one, uh, our carbohydrate, as I said, needs to be or should be of high uh, glycemic index. Remember that we've been talking about low glycemic index and high glycemic index. After recovery, immediately after recovery, in order for them to get as much, like, uh, as much uh, recovery as possible, if you can give them a high glycemic index uh, food, you need to then make sure that they ingest high glycemic index food. Secondly, um, you need to then make sure that it's in the form of fructose uh, to promote liver glycogen re resynthesis. And you, have, you also see that I've put um, uh, uh, some fruits and also some vegetables up there. And uh, that will really make them to, uh, to get as much uh, uh, glycogen as possible uh, in, in the time, in no time. Uh, players also need to refuel after every hour. Uh, if they go home, you need to, we need to, to, they need to be advised after every hour to continue to replenish wherever they are. Um, the carbohydrates that they are also taking needs to be combined with, um, with protein. Um, a yogurt, uh, just the yogurt that's there has got lactose inside, has got some proteins inside. Um, the way and the casein, uh, the way it's more important as compared to the casein. So if, 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 if uh, players are advised to have at least a whey uh, uh, containing proteins as compared to um, a casein uh, containing proteins. Um, a carbohydrate a drink also to replenish electrolyte um, is also important for them to have and also uh, to really make them aware that this is what we want within 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 our clubs as a policy, and I'm saying milk will also uh, replenish them as quickly as possible. If they have milk uh, aside, if they have uh, uh, yogurt or they have cheese there, they or chunks of cheese there, they, it can be replenished as quickly as possible. Now, these are the examples of the post-match recovery snacks that they can have, and that contains 50 grams of carbohydrate, three slices of brown bread, um, two cups of porridge. Uh, it can be any other cereal, uh, as long as it's not Kellogg's, um, uh, uh, um, uh, what do you call these yellow ones? Um, not cornflakes. If it's all bran, then that's much better. Uh, one cup of macaroni or rice or semp, uh, three medium potatoes also will give you 50 grams of, 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 um, of carbohydrate. I'm sure you've quite seen that um, the runners, have, as they are running on the road, uh, they are also giving um, uh, boiled potatoes. Uh, with players also, we can also do the same. As they are playing on the ground, when they come back to come and have water, you just give them a chunk of uh, 50 grams. 50 grams is not a lot. It's very small. Um, three portions of uh, fruits. A, a fruit salad with 250 ml of yogurt, 250 ml of yogurt or inkomazi. Inkomazi also works very, very well. A 750 sports drink um, or maybe 500 ml of, 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 of an apple juice. Um, those that are giving 10, 10, uh, 10 grams of protein, you can have at least 50 to, or 40 to 50 lean meat, uh, either skin, skinless chicken. You can, as they come back from, from half time or maybe uh, immediately after, after playing, uh, you have those things around the table for them, for them to eat. Two eggs, um, custard also will help, but it must be low fat. A milkshake will also ha help a lot. Uh, dried beans will also and lentils that we can put around the table. They must be cooked. Lentils must be cooked in order for them to eat that. Um, 
We also said for them to recover very quickly, they need to combine carbohydrate, at least 50 grams of carbohydrate uh, and 10 grams of protein. And those things that I've written there, the kinds of food that I've written there, will give you 50 grams of carbohydrate combined uh, with protein. Uh, they can have that immediately after a smoothie. Um, it's, 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 it's also very quick to do. Um, yogurt is al are already available. Uh, they can also have that as quickly as possible. Cottage cheese, sandwiches with cottage cheese, that's a snack that I've been talking about, um, which is also helpful for them to recover quickly. Now, the other thing that we have also seen is players are relying a lot on, on supplements. Um, that and supplements are giving us a problem with players, um, and we end up uh, players end up being uh, being uh, being uh, positive um, uh, for doping. So it's important that players understand that food f food first is important. If um, you don't have um, a dietitian or you don't have a sports nutritionist to monitor what the players are eating or players are doing within the 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 the, the teams then you can end up with 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 those with those problems most players do believe or believe in or do not believe in food first policy we believe that it's important that they eat first um, and then if they have any deficiency we can then have some supplements for them to have whatever they need to have secondly supplements are a multi billion uh, industry uh, and are faced with inaccurate uh, in and biased information. Um, because they want to sell, uh, they will tell players that if you take this, it will make you like that. So only to find that that's not the case at all. Um, supplements also are convenient sometimes. Um, not all of them are convenient. I mean, you just take and put into a jar, shake, and then you drink. But unfortunately, you end up uh, having something uh, positively uh, identifying something that is not wanted or an ingredient that is not wanted. And some players or uh, most of our players, coaches, don't read also the labels because they are thinking that whatever it's been told on TV or on the media, um, uh, they think that it's important for them and they will just take it. Ultimately, they end up with problems. Uh, some, supplements, um, some supplements have and continue to produce positive drug uh, tests. And, and therefore, it's important that players understand that supplements are supplements and not a substitute for the, the food at all. The solution is to have a sports nutrition policy. And I always advise the children that I'm working with at Michelle House in Polukwane, uh, we have a sport, uh, sports nutrition policy for them. Um, they know exactly that they, ca they are allowed to have this, they are not allowed to have this. Parents are also supporting that. It's also rubbing off in the family. Um, families are also saying, we did not know that this will help us in, in our home. So if, if clubs are having a sports nutrition policy uh, that all supplements that are used by, um, by, by, by teams uh, should be governed by a robust um, a sports nutrition uh, policy in order to achieve one, to make sure that each and every um, uh, uh, supplement is evaluated or eva e e evaluate potential supplements for health or for performance benefit uh, for the players, whether it, it does have a, a benefit for players or not. Secondly, we need to also conduct what we call a quality assurance uh, on sports nutrition companies to see if indeed what they are talking about has been uh, peer reviewed. Because some of the uh, teams will tell you or some of the companies will tell you that this sports um, uh, drink will give you one, two, three, only to find that it was only tested with two people. Um, today, people are telling you about um, the uh, uh, blood group diet. And everybody is following the blood group diet. Doesn't work. It was only tested for two people. It was not uh, general. It's not general. It's not peer peer reviewed. And everybody is running around and using that. The other thing that they are using is Slatsalama food. <laughs> um, the sports nutrition policy will also help you to develop protocols for the use of 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 of, of supplements uh, and which supplements would be allowed for players to use. I think it's important also, one, that players make an effort to afford uh, or an effort to gain their required macro and micro intake, um, micronutrient intake through eating a balanced diet. Secondly, there needs to be a team management or team management coach. Coaches and players need to consult uh, qualified dietitians or sports dietitians to help achieve such a balanced diet. 
Thirdly, there needs to be a decision to use supplements uh, which would be uh, in consultation with a sports dietitian in order for the sports dietitian to tell you whether this is good or that's not good at all. Um, the, other, the other solution is the supplements can form an important strategy when there are known deficiencies. If there, if there are deficiencies, then you need a sports dietitian to tell you that this person is suffering from iron deficiency or this person doesn't have enough iron and therefore we need to give them a supplement for them to have one, two, three. Some dietary supplements are difficult to achieve from, a, uh, from the diet, like creatine, um, beta alanine, or caffeine, and therefore we can be able to then recommend to players to use if they, w they really would like to use them. Uh, to use these supplements, you need to make sure that you have discussed with the sports dietitians before. So it's important that that policy be drafted within each and every team, and, and the teams agree uh, that this is how we're going to be operating when it comes to supplements. Supplements are not uh, and will never uh, be a one-size-fits-all. Size you need to approach somebody who is, in, who is really knowledgeable in supplements in order for you to then use them. Lastly, there needs to be a team. Uh, teams need to have a sports dietitian to assist the coach and also players in order for them to make sure that they perform very well. Lastly, a sound nutrition strategy needs to be in place to support the consistent training and in preparation of the opt optimum match performance of players for them to recover and to promote recovery very quickly, to promote adaptation to training at all times for players and also to optimize physique. However, the last part is for players to have team building. When they eat together, they will be able to share um, how they can perform together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Matthews. I think uh, we all can walk away with that with some lessons, and I'm happy you brought out the concept of food first and not supplements. For the next speaker, who's the last one before we all can refill our glycogen stores, um, we've, we've found him at one of the retirement villages. Uh, he's a well-renowned physician, he's one of my mentors, who's taught me a lot in sports medicine. Uh, he's a sports physician, occupational physician, travel physician. He's been the longest serving ex-SAFA uh, doctor as well. And uh, we've signed the permission slip, they've given us permission to let him out here until lunchtime, so we have to return him by 2 o'clock. I'd like to call upon Dr. Ephraim Namatswarani uh, to talk to us about travel medicine within sports medicine. If this was a radio broadcasting industry, they will call mine a graveyard slot. Thanks to the station manager, Tulani. <laughs> On a more serious note, I was filled with sadness, shock, and disbelief uh, when I learned about the passing away of a 20-year-old a 19-year-old, rather, Malawian under-20 international, Abel Mwagalima. Abel is from Malawi. He played for Chitipa United Football Club in Malawi, uh, second division, scored 37 goals in South Africa. The last time that was achieved uh, was probably 100 years ago. Uh, he helped the team in the process gain promotion to the top flight. That was last year. And was snatched by a club in Portugal, sporting club, the Esmeris. It's a lower league club, but uh, very good in unearthing and polish diamonds. Polish them and sell them to bigger clubs. Abel came back to Malawi in the last week of uh, April this year to represent his country in the national under-20 African Nations Cup qualifier against Swaziland. He played the match and after the match went back to Portugal. Two weeks later presented with flu-like symptoms. The usual old story. Eh? And uh, unfortunately 
that complicated into cerebral malaria. So he was probably misdiagnosed initially. And he died exactly a month ago, on the 20th of April this year. So other players were a bit lucky. Kolo Toure went to back home to Ivory Coast. He was still with Liverpool in 2014 to join his teammates for the 2014 World Cup camp in Brazil. His uh, trip to Brazil was delayed because he contracted malaria. Fortunately, it was diagnosed early and he was treated successfully. Lomana Lualua, uh, DRC International, he used to play for Newcastle, also went back to DRC to join his teammates contracted malaria, treated successfully, and fortunately he survived. But in 2003, when I was team doctor for Team South Africa, during the All Africa Games in Abuja, when we con concluded the All Africa Games, uh, teams went back home, Egypt included, and uh, on arrival home two weeks later, uh, they lost two young athletes. Uh, and on that note, our condolences, Dennis, to Abel Mwakalima, and may his soul rest in peace. So had travel medicine consultation taken place, these deaths and illnesses could have been prevented. Because travel medicine seeks to, to protect athletes and soccer players against such illnesses and injuries. We try to manage problems arising in travelers coming back or coming from abroad. So our consultations are not only when athletes or players are going abroad, but it's also important to look after them when they come back. And a typical example is those two Egyptian athletes who went back home and uh, unfortunately died back home in Egypt. We are also concerned about the impact of tourism on health and services of tourists. And uh, this uh, travel medicine is a very new multidisciplinary specialty area. Uh, most of you would have gone abroad on holidays, but uh, I think we can count on one hand those who have consulted a travel medicine clinic. So unfortunately, I'm in two specialities, which are still very unpopular, is travel medicine and also sports medicine. In Australia, if a child gets injured at school, the first thing the mom will, want, will ask for is a sports physician. The same cannot be said about South Africa. The possible travel medicine clients in a typical travel medicine clinic will be your tourists, short-term uh, business travelers, long-term business travelers, groups such as sportsmen. And today, we are going to focus on that. The pre-travel consultation, I'll try to be quick because we are running uh, out of time already. Uh, it's important for you, Tulani and others, to know where the team is traveling to and the intended length of stay. And I heard you having almost an argument on Supersport 4, uh, Africa show, where some people were saying you could have easily phoned uh, Dennis if the team is going to Gabon. Why not just phone and check the hotels? It's not the same. So you were right. Uh, the areas of those countries they plan to go in our case is football. What they plan to do in that country uh, by what means they are traveling. That's also important because Zimbabwe, Harare's capit uh, Harare, the capital city of Zimbabwe, is malaria-free. But uh, between Bait Bridge, Yobibo, uh, uh, and other cities from Bait Bridge to Harare uh, are malaria risk areas. So if you are traveling on road, especially if it's uh, in the evening, chances of getting malaria are high. Whereas if you are flying directly into Harare and back, uh, there is no risk of malaria there. So it's important to take cognizance 
of the mode of transport when you are traveling to these areas. This slide I put just to illustrate that uh, travel medicine consultations do not end there. So, so it's important even during travel to, to still be in touch with your athletes and more importantly also when they come back to do a follow-up. In this same trip or games that we had in 2003, in South Africa on arriving back we treated I think about 15 player athletes with malaria. So it's very important to do a follow-up uh, post-competition. Areas to be covered during a, a pre-travel consultation. It's important to emphasize the use of uh, repellents uh, to prevent uh, mosquito bites. And those mosquitoes could be for yellow fever, uh, AJPT mosquitoes, or for malaria. And remember that uh, malaria mosquitoes do bite uh, in the evenings uh, between sunset and sunrise, whereas yellow fever mosquitoes bite uh, during the day. It's important to emphasize on water. Unfortunately, un unfortunately in our continent, uh, the purification of water is not very good. So the advice is to always drink bottled water. And even in terms of brushing the teeth, if uh, finances allow, it's important to brush also with bottled water. STIs is a reality. We try to discourage players and even officials uh, not to engage in sexual activities. <laughs> but believe me, it does, it does happen. A few years ago, we had an incident uh, in Cameroon. A player got the services of social workers. And, uh, <clears throat> and they negotiated a price, which was the equi equivalent of a thousand rand, but in dollars. And uh, after getting the services, the service provider said, no, I said 1,000 US dollars. And the uh, police said to come in, he said, it happened. Uh, we were with the under 23s, I think, at the time. So, so we ended up paying because the police said, there's no way you will fly out. <coughs> <laughs> so, so it does happen. <coughs> uh, vaccinations, uh, we are not interested there. This is the expanded program of immunization, EPI, which is uh, issued to everybody, uh, ch children, as they are born. So in South Africa, we don't have a problem of that. But in certain parts of Africa, children are still not getting all the immunization schedules. Uh, there are different uh, types of vaccines, hepatitis A, uh, meningitis, which I think is important, uh, polio, typhoid, and yellow fever, which is mandatory in countries that are uh, yellow fever high risk. Uh, malaria prophylaxis, it's important if you will be going to those countries that do have malaria and uh, regular medication, those uh, who have chronic illnesses. Uh, Nick uh, will know that in his team he had athletes who, or soccer players who had asthma, so it's important that they take their chronic medications along. And it's not unusual, uh, Dennis, uh, it's, not, it's not here, uh, for Tulani to get officials, head of delegations, who come join the national team and uh, they are on chronic medications and they tell you they forgot when they are there already. And when you don't have the medications, they, they, I mean, these are executive committee members, they come back and say the doctor is not really up to scratch. So, according to me, I think Africa is the most difficult continent to navigate. Uh, you know, in, in Europe, uh, I'm not trying to shift the blame, but uh, I once had Alex Ferguson, <coughs> a former Man United head coach, 
We know he's in hospital now. May he recover quickly. <laughs> uh, complaining after the CAF Champions League draw. He was complaining because he got drawn against Lokomotiv Moscow. That's a team in Russia. And he said that was the last draw he wanted. The reason? Because it was too far. And this is the distance from England to Moscow. It's 2,893.8 kilometers. And it's a direct flight, 3 hours 45 minutes. There are regular flights all the time in London to Moscow. But the distance in Europe is way too much. But in South Africa alone, I'm not talking from one country to, to the other. <coughs> Teams in Cape Town travel this distance to my hometown, Toyandong. So they will fly from Cape Town to Johannesburg, which is two hours. Now, if they have money, most of them won't spend. They will then fly from Johannesburg to Pulukwane, which is one hour. That's three hours. Remember in Europe, three hours is like crazy. And then from Pulukwane to Toyando is two hours drive. There, there, there is no airport, by the way. <clears throat> now, that's two plus three which is five. And most teams will land in Johannesburg and drive. Uh, that's Africa. Now, if, if, if Tulani Bafana Bafana had to go play in Tunisia, this is the distance. And there is no direct flight from Johannesburg to Tunis. So it's either you fly from here and go somewhere there. And in our continent, flights are not very reliable. So the most convenient route will be from Johannesburg to Dubai. And then from Dubai to Tunis. We are probably the only continent who travel between their countries via another continent. <laughs> When you played Cape Verde, I think you traveled 16 hours. Yeah. So there were two matches back to back on a Saturday on, and on a Tuesday. You left Johannesburg via Gabon, correct? And to Cape Verde, 16 hours. Played on Saturday from Cape Verde to Gabon, back to Johannesburg, another 16 hours and you had to play on, on Tuesday. You had to fly again to Devon. My Melody Sundowns, I was talking to, that, to them on Thursday night. They, they are going to play on Tuesday in Guinea, Conakry. So they, they flew from Johannesburg on Thursday night to Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, for five hours. And there was no connecting flight immediately to Guinea. So they stayed there for five hours, that's 10. And then flew to Guinea Conakry for eight hours, that's 18 hours. Uh, I went to Sierra Leone twice with Bafana Bafana. Uh, these are the pictures there because you, you have to use, to get to your final destination, you have to use a boat. And uh, they are not very safe. Eh? And the reason is because, uh, remember to land there, there is no direct flight. So the, the international airport, Lungi International Airport, is in, in the city of Lungi. It's a small city. 
And the big town, the national stadium, the hotels are in the capital city, Freetown. But there is no... <laughs> <coughs> so the roads here are bad. Nobody uses them. So y you have to get here though. And the only way to get here is by boat. And we used a boat. We arrived there at 1 a.m. in the morning. And we had to do that in the dark. And you must go there and perform. So it's not easy traveling in Africa, besides the diseases. Uh, the main cause of mortality of deaths uh, in tourists, uh, it's, yes, infectious diseases, but the major cause is usually pre-existing diseases such as those who have heart diseases and uh, dying of heart attack and strokes and also sometimes non-travel accidents. We know about what happened during the September 11. Morbidity of travelers' diseases, uh, studies are not very conclusive. Uh, because no proper research really has been done. The few that have been done were based on medical insurance claims, self-reported information from returning travelers, incidents of diseases also in returning travelers. And uh, there are lots of diseases, unfortunately, in Africa. So it's very difficult uh, to travel uh, throughout this continent. Whereas if you were going to Europe, you don't have to worry about vaccinations and prophylaxis. Malaria is one of them. I won't go into details there. Uh, suffice to say that it's important to take malaria prophylaxis and also emphasize to your players that on coming back, those extra tablets that are remaining are not uh, for decorating their room at home, but they have to finish the course. I put this slide here to show that uh, it's very easy to prevent malaria and more importantly, very easy to eradicate malaria in Africa if they will uh, on people who are in charge is there. So malaria can be eradicated because uh, Zim didn't have malaria before uh, when it was still called Rhodesia. But now there is malaria. So malaria can be eradicated if we use uh, 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 the spraying uh, which happens in South Africa, uh, but the will seemingly is not there. And remember that pathogens travel as fast as transportation and borders are not respected. Uh, for us who are travel medicine practitioners, it's important to have high index of clinical Suspicion. Uh, if Abel Muakalima, uh, the doctors have had high index of clinical suspicion, they would have picked it up early. Malaria is very easy to treat, and it could have been treated successfully before complicating into cerebral malaria. In South Africa, I have had I had one uh, patient uh, who came flu-like symptoms, young child and no history of travel at all, uh, besides going to Pretoria. Uh, but she, to cut the long story short, she had uh, taxi malaria. So there was a taxi from Mozambique, uh, which transported mosquitoes to South Africa. And she was bitten by those mosquitoes, and she got malaria. So you need to have a very high index of clinical suspicion. This is just a map to show the malaria risk areas in South Africa. Malaria, South Africa is malaria free, but uh, there is uh, lots of malaria there and there. So it goes without saying that areas around there will have malaria, uh, albeit not throughout the year. So malaria here in South Africa in these areas will be seasonal. And uh, it's important also to take prophylaxis when you are going to these areas during the summer months. Those months are between October and May. So to make it easy for my clients, I say when you go to these areas during the months 
that have R, letter R, you must have malaria prophylaxis. So that will be your September, October, November, December, January, February, March, and April. Yes, we added two extra, one extra month on each on either side, but uh, it's important to take prophylaxis when you do go to these areas. Map showing yellow fever areas again, again. Who is shouldering most of the uh, uh, problems? It's Africa, South America as well. All the countries in South America are high risk yellow fever countries except Argentina. In Africa, all countries in the West, Central, uh, East, uh, Southern Africa, we are free of yellow fever. But Zambia, Joseph, was declared a yellow fever risk country, I think, in 2011. But that has since been lifted, isn't it? Yeah. But uh, when my teams travel there, I still give them yellow fever uh, vaccination because you never know when you know it's always safe to to give them a prophylaxis and Tulani I think you do that as well so your Zaire Zanzibar uh, the risk is very low according to the to the WHO there is no need to give yellow fever vaccination but you see the problem is most countries are not aware and uh, I just vaccinate because you don't want to go there and uh, they tell you, no, we don't care about WHO. We want yellow fever certificate, so it's better to vaccinate. A map showing West Africa, West African countries. Uh, the next one is uh, meningitis. And you can see the meningitis belt there, and that's because it's in the middle of uh, Africa. So that's the meningitis belt area. So when you do go there, I think it's very important to, to vaccinate. <coughs> Traveler's diarrhea, I said earlier that it's important to only drink bottled water uh, to avoid this. Uh, the last thing you want, even as a tourist, is to get to your destination and spend five days indoors because of diarrhea. And uh, I advise my clients that if you can't boil it, cook it, peel it, then leave it. So anything that is boiled is safe. Anything that is freshly cooked is safe. Anything, a fruit that you peel yourself like a banana is fine. Uh, oranges will be fine. But fruit salads that you find prepared, a big no. And it, all cold foods, when I travel with the teams, I don't allow my players to, to eat. STIs, we have touched on this, but besides uh, HIV, there is also hepatitis B and various other infections. In fact, in my medical bag, I always make sure that there are condoms. It's not uncommon to be confronted by players after a match coming uh, asking for condoms. In fact, we were in Ghana when uh, I wish Dennis was not here because he will go harm other players. Uh, we're in Ghana when after playing a match, a player knocked on my door around 2 o'clock in the morning. When I opened, he said, Doc, Nkela is in Now, he, he already had the girl in the room. Now, imagine if, if I didn't have condoms. Was he going to tell her to go back? No. And... Uh, if we didn't have them, uh, action would have occurred. And uh, who knows today that player could be in trouble. So it's always important. Uh, I know there are some doctors and physios who are a bit reluctant to carry condoms, but it's important to always have them. Altitude, again, I won't go into this, but it's important to prepare for this in time. In terms of acclimatization, I think it's very difficult because you need about 10 days to do so. And chances of uh, having the team for 10 days are very slim. Right where we are now, altitude is sitting at 1,700 meters above sea level. 
uh, and symptoms usually start occurring at 1,500. And that is why teams from along the coast and even your New Zealand, Australian rugby teams, when they come here, they struggle. But they will prefer to come on the day of the match and travel back uh, immediately. So if not uh, well managed, uh, the severity of altitude sickness can uh, get worse and you can have complications such as uh, high altitude pulmonary edema and uh, high altitude cerebral edema, which are extremely fatal. Uh, just to show that between 35 and 5,500 severe altitude illness occurs. And the reason I'm showing this is because uh, in this capital city of Bolivia, La Paz, altitude is sitting at 3,600 meters above sea level. And I'm not sure if you have watched games. Uh, Bolivia almost always win at home because uh, I watched a game, Brazil, uh, Argentina against Bolivia, uh, in Bolivia. And Argentinian players were literally, literally walking because they couldn't run at all. And in fact, FIFA at some stage had banned games in Bolivia. But the ban was uh, suspended because people felt we are denying, because they, they, they would have had to play a home match all the time outside of their country, what about their supporters and so forth. So people felt just like with the testosterone levels, it was a bit inhumane and insensitive. And that ban was suspended, games are taking place there now, and uh, Bolivia continue to win at home. Jet lag is also important. Uh, by definition, jet lag is the feeling of disorientation as a result of crossing multiple time zones. So uh, as long as you are crossing time zones, you might have effects thereof. In Africa, traveling from any country to the other, uh, the effects of jet lag are very minimal, if not non-existent. And that's because at most we cross about two or so, and you shouldn't be experiencing uh, effects of jet lag after two time zones. The effect of jet lag are worse when traveling eastward. So if this was the world map here, yeah, jet lag will be worse when you are traveling towards Australia than when you are traveling towards the US or South America. And the reason is because when you travel eastward, you are cutting the hours. Uh, you, you, you end up in a day spending less hours when you travel westward, uh, the hours of a day are prolonged. So it's said that you are uh, at least having some more time to acclimatize. And those are the effects of a uh, jet lag there. I won't go into that. It goes into the physiology around what jet lag is. Uh, except to note that traveling north to south and vice versa, uh, there is no jet lag, but it comes with its own uh, problems because uh, Barcelona traveled to South Africa during the week and it was summer there in, in Spain. And they came here and it's winter, uh, very cold. So climate changes because of traveling uh, north to south and vice versa. Treatment of jet lag, acclimatization, again, time is a problem. But uh, currently, there is no treatment uh, except lifestyle adjustments, uh, physical fitness, uh, controlling underlying conditions. And prevention is choosing uh, early morning arrival flights. So, so if you are going to Australia, it would be nice to choose a flight that will land there in the morning so that you have the whole day and start your day properly and so forth. In-fight preparation is also important. Small things like changing your watch time 
to the destination time. Uh, there are others who use melatonin. I have never used it uh, to also help combat the effects of jet lag. Heat and humidity. Uh, Sundowns are in Guinea now. I can tell you it's very close to the equator and uh, the heat is terrible. They are along the coast to make it worse humidity as well. It's important on coming back as a travel medicine practitioner to do a post-travel consultation uh, and follow up your clients to make sure that they don't suffer from this disease and therefore end up with death. So every morning in Africa, an antelope wakes up, it knows it must outrun the fastest lion or it will be killed. Every morning in Africa, a lion wakes up, it knows it, it must run faster than the slowest antelope or it will starve. So in Africa, it doesn't really matter whether you are the lion or an antelope. When the sun comes up, you will better be running. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Nemasarani. So we're going to stop with the questions, etc. now because we're running very, very late today. And I think we're going to break for about 30 minutes for lunch.